Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the second session in on shearlets and geometric frames. Um, again, I hope you're still you're not too tired for another one and a half hours of fun. Um, okay, first of all, I have some. I have a present for you. Two presents. The MATLAB codes for tomorrow's session printed out for you. So please pass that through. And also um, the slides for today printed out. So you can follow and also take notes if you want. So we have, well, spent about two hours printing them out and stapling them. And so I hope you will uh, benefit from those printouts. The slide, yeah, 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 just a second. So I will, uh, uh -huh. I will try to announce everything. Uh, okay, first of all, if you go on the web page, you know the usual web page for the um, Morley chair, doctoral school, abstracts. If you go there, you scroll down to this session, you see you can download the slides from yesterday. Um, they can also, I mean, you know, the material I presented to you yesterday is like not really contained in a in a good book or so. So this might even be useful for you as a reference in this type of nonlinear approximation theory. At least it includes some sketches of proofs. So you might want to download this from here. Um, today's slides are already online too. So you might want to also download them. They will not contain many proofs. So they only contain one proof, mainly because the proofs of most of the things that I will talk about today are really complicated. So slides would be not 100 pages, but maybe 200 or so. And also you can download the MATLAB files for tomorrow's session. Yeah. Okay, another thing. Most of you are already very proficient in MATLAB, but some of you might be new to MATLAB. So there is also, if you scroll down to the bottom, through the inverse problems, to the very bottom you will find a link to some websites where you have some MATLAB tutorials. So the first one up here, this one is like just very basic commands. So if you're really new, you, you should really take a look at this before, before the practical session starts tomorrow. Otherwise, it will be very difficult for you to, to follow. This one is a tutorial where also some more uh, advanced concepts are covered. So please, if you're not reasonably proficient in MATLAB, you, you might want to check this out today. Yeah. Okay, other things. Tomorrow at 2.15, the first MATLAB session will start. I already said it will be done by Axel. On this topic, it will cover implementation of shielded transforms. The session will be in this room for everybody. 
So all of you, please come here tomorrow at 2.15. If possible, bring your laptop, download this zip folder I just, show, I just showed you. And those of you who do not have a laptop, please share a laptop if you want. So there are only few of you who do not have a laptop and I'm sure you will find someone who would be willing to share his or her laptop with you. But some of you might want to uh, go along and, and, and uh, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it is not necessary, but it's, it would help probably. Okay, also tomorrow, um, you see there are not too many plugs here. So some cables and plugs will be installed tomorrow for the session. But still, I would advise you, if you want to bring your laptop, if you want to use your laptop, charge it before. Uh, I mean, the session is three hours. So I hope you have a good battery. Uh, all right. I think that's it. Another thing. So... I would like to, 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 to I mean, the, the, the material that I'm presenting to you is basically recent research. Yeah. These developments of curvelets and shearlets and so on, this is fairly recent. So therefore, um, there does not exist a comprehensive reference. I, I cannot really you know, give you a book and, and you read this and then you know everything. So kind of you have to find your way through the research literature if you want to, to, to go into this direction. First thing, I mean, if you're interested in these methods, the easiest thing for you is to come to me and talk to me. Yeah, I will be here all week. I'm very happy to discuss research problems, applications with you, or just go a little deeper into, you know, what is covered than, than what I can do here. So please don't, do not be shy, and, and if you're interested in anything, just, you know, just ask me. Okay, um, another thing, there is some write-up. If you go to my webpage, matethz blah 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 P Groß teaching you can go here to these lecture notes and this is a course I gave in 2012 and there are some lecture notes it's a course on time frequency analysis um, you might find it helpful if you want to like in general you might want to find it helpful because it presents kind of my perspective of, of, of you know, wavelet analysis and, and curvelet analysis. So you see some, you know, Fourier series basics, um, frames, nonlinear approximation. You, you see the results that we covered yesterday, then some GABA analysis, wavelet analysis, and finally some curvelet analysis. So you might, you know, if, if you want, you might check this out. And, and um, it is a little more complete, although it is also still in progress. Okay, so that's all the literature I can offer you. And, well, that's that. What else? Let's go back. Let's start with the second part of the course. Okay, so quick re recap of yesterday. What you should know, not much. 
we have a signal class. For us, it was anisotropic singularity structures. As they appear in images or in as solutions of certain PDEs. And we have seen, and I mean, I think this is actually very remarkable. We have seen that for typical signal classes, you can give a benchmark result, you can quantify the theoretically best possible approximation rate you can ever get using any method. We did this using a method that uh, is called hypercube embeddings. And we were able to, to quantify the theoretically optimal end-term approximation rate for a number of signal classes. And also this method of, of, of hypercube embeddings is quite general. So if you, you know, if you have a, a class of signals you would like to approximate, you might uh, be able to prove what is the best, to find out what is the best you can do using these hypercube embeddings. And assume I have a dictionary. Um, then I can also consider the best end-term approximation rate over all elements in my signal class in this dictionary. For instance, the wavelet dictionary. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. And as a dictionary phi is optimal for a signal class if this holds. So if my dictionary achieves the theoretically best possible approximation rate. Okay, that's what, what we have to take away from yesterday. Then also I would like to make one tiny comment. Um, well, I, I think I don't need to. Um, there was a, a very good question yesterday and, and I don't remember exactly who asked it, but um, we were proving this uh, hypercube embedding theorem that uh, if there exists a hypercube embedding, then this quantity is bounded by some factor. And one of you, I'm not sure who, asked, well, you, the, the, the proof was based on, on an encoding scheme. And someone asked, well, the coefficients have to be bounded uh, for this encoding scheme. Well, it was you, okay. Yeah. And uh, I was, you know, a bit caught by surprise. Actually, they don't have to be bounded. Uh, you can improve your coding scheme because you can orthonormalize the, the uh, active coefficients and then you get a bounded, you can get a bound on the size of these coefficients by asking this signal class to be globally bounded in L2. So you can improve this encoding. So this is not required in this result, actually. Okay, but uh, probably this is just to, of interest to to you. But uh, I just uh, wanted to to point it out that this was correct yesterday. Okay. Oh, 15 minutes of preparations. Well, now let's start with an outline. Yesterday we looked briefly at wavelets. Today we will consider curvelets, shearlets, and parabolic molecules. I will tell you what all this is. Some related systems and applications. I just picked some applications, specific applications, where actually problems are solved that cannot be solved with any other methods. So it's not just improvement of, of wavelets, but it's some, some problems are solved that you cannot really solve with, a, with any other schemes. So that's the type of applications that I chose to present to you. Um, so let's recall what we want to do. We want to approximate functions with curved singularities. That was our goal from the beginning. Yeah? So we have our signal class, E cartoon images, where you know you have a smooth part in here, smooth part out here, you have a curve, smooth curve separating them. If you want, you could also just make this boundary curve piecewise C2. It will not change anything in the results that we will later on see. Yeah? 
typically this type of signals occurs in images. Yeah. Clear? Um, but I mean, still, it's just a mathematical model for images, and you can always argue, well, I mean, for some types of images, another model might be better. Um, but also, there exists there exist PDEs where you can prove that your solution falls into such a, a signal class. Yeah. So there are even situations where you know that what you would like to approximate is in this signal class. So that's our goal, and we recall also the benchmark approximation rate n to the minus one. You cannot do better. We know this from yesterday. What else do we know? We know that if we take two-dimensional wavelets, two-dimensional wavelet frame, wavelet basis, then the best NTM approximation rate I can ever get is one half and not one. Now you might say, well, okay, I mean, one half, one, who, I mean, it's, who cares? But this is actually a big deal. Yeah. What does this mean? I have wavelets. I have my image F. And let's suppose I want to approximate this image up to five digits. How many bits do I have to spend? If I would like to, if I have an image with these anisotropic structures, I want to approximate it up to five digits. How many bits do I need? Hmm. Well, okay. Fn, it means um, Fn requires n bits, right? I mean, this is the n term approximation. Fn is just a linear combination of the largest of the wavelets, the n wavelets with the largest coefficients. Yeah. So I need n bits, and I know that uh, this f minus fn, this n term approximation rate is of order one half. So n to the minus one half. is of order 10 to the minus 5, and now you, you do the math. Yeah. So n would have to be at least 10 to the 10. And that's already quite a big number. Yeah. So you need at least 10 to the 10 uh, bits to store such an image up to, to five digits. Now, the optimal rate is n to the minus 1, so what we want is so, goal, that I have a dictionary with which I can compute an n term approximation rate of order 1. And then I need only 10 to the 5 bits. And this is still, a, I mean, this is still a reasonable number. So, and of course, the more precision I want, the, the bigger this difference gets, certainly. So, I mean, this is a big deal, and this makes a big difference, this difference between approximation rate one half and approximation rate one. Okay. And now, well, the question is, can we find better dictionaries? Can we find dictionaries which are optimal for this signal class? So what we want to do is we want to construct a tight frame for L2 of R2 such that for all cartoon images we have that the best n term approximation error decays at a rate comparable to n to the minus 1. Now, does everybody recall what, what best n term approximation error means? Who still remembers what is the best n term approximation rate? Okay, so I think I, I briefly have to repeat this.
fn, so f is a given image or signal, and fn can be written as, as a linear combination j in j, cj, phi j, with only n coefficients. And under this condition, under this condition, um, Fn minimizes the L2 error among all functions which can be represented by n basis functions. And this means if these coefficients are reasonable in size that I can store this n-term approximation using n bits. Yeah? That's how JPEG works. That's how compression transform coding works. Yeah. Please try to, to stay with me at least to up to this point so, to, to the, so that you know what, what is the best end term approximation and what we actually want to do. Okay, now, well, in this section I will present to you a construction of a tight frame for which the best end term approximation rate for these cartoon images is optimal. Yeah. I will, uh, okay. Now, the idea is as follows. We have seen yesterday why wavelets were not optimal. Because 2D wavelets are supported in isotropic quadrilaterals of width 2 to the O minus J. This should be minus J. So they are always supported. So a wavelet, a 2D wavelet can be written like this. Psi 2 to the J X 2 to the J Y. Well, minus K1 minus K2. And this is this guy is always supported in in some quadrilateral of side length two to the minus j two to the minus j, yeah, because this dilation operation is isotropic, so it scales each coordinate in the same size. Okay. All right, and we have seen that if we have such an isotropic dilation and we want to cover a singularity curve, we need too many elements. So what can we do about that? We can try to make the dilation different. We can try to just scale a bit less. So this is j over 2 in the first coordinate. And this will give us an anisotropic dilation. This guy will now be supported in something 2 to the j over 2, 2 to the j. This guy will be supported in a rectangle of length 2 to the minus j half, 2 to the and height 2 to the minus j. just by modifying this translation a little bit. Okay, and what else do we do? We also add rotations. So we take these elements and we also rotate these, these guys here. That's the basic idea. And then we get, we get basis elements which are supported in such rotated uh, quads of you know, of, of, of length 2 to the minus j half and height 2 to the minus j. Basic idea, simple idea. Okay, and now that's the idea. We want basis functions supported in, in anisotropic rectangles of length uh, 2 to the minus j half and with 2 to the minus j. So oh, everywhere in these numbers there is a minus missing. If we also allow rotations along, let's say, now this is correct, 2 to the j half equispaced angles, we might have a chance. Why? 
well, at least I can cover this singularity curve with much fewer of those rectangles at a fixed scale because these rectangles are anisotropic. So there is one longer side here and I can cover the singularity curve with much fewer elements. This gives us some hope. And now, based on this idea, we would like to construct generalizations of wavelet bases. We want to construct systems which are indexed by a scale j, as usual, as you know from wavelets, with a parameter l. This l determines this rotation that we apply and k determines the translation. And here we have a definition which should remind you of wavelets. There are only two differences. First, this dilation matrix is not isotropic, but it is anisotropic. So you have here, in this d2 to the j, this is a diagonal matrix, and it scales the first coordinate by 2 to the j, and the second coordinate by 2 to the j half. It makes, if j grows, it makes the support of this guy more and more needle-like. And you apply a rotation. And this rotation for a fixed scale you apply at about 2 to the j half equispaced angles. So you have a system, you scale anisotropically, you rotate, and you translate. Similar to wavelets, you have one more parameter. This parameter determines the rotation. Okay, now that's nice to, to have as a, as a basic guideline, but in fact, um, we want to construct a tight frame. So how can we realize such a system? And now I will, I will present to you one, so historically the first construction of curvelets, which uh, goes back to Kande and Donohoe. Uh, they published it in 2004. And um, you should always, if you think of curvelets, you should always have this in, your, in the back of your head. But the actual realization is a, is a bit different because uh, it is not so easy to construct tight frames exactly based on this relation, but you have to relax it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, how to construct curvelets? Okay, curvelets, what I want to have is a tight frame for L2 of R2. So, let's see. I want a tight frame for L2 of R2 because I'm treating two dimensional signals. How do we construct this tight frame? We construct it by constructing a tight frame in Fourier space. Yeah. This is equivalent because of you know the Fourier isometry that I hope everybody knows. Yeah. Um, how do you do this? Well, you do the following. Basically, you decompose R2 into what is called parabolic wedges for a scale j and an angle l. You define wedges in polar coordinates. That's all numbers in polar coordinates are phi such that, well, R is between 2 to the j minus 1, 2 to the j plus 1, and phi is in, let's say, uh, pi half 
times L minus 1, 2 to the minus j over 2 pi half L plus 1, 2 to the minus j over 2. How do these wedges look like? Here is an illustration of these wedges. Yeah. Basically, you have R is in some annulus. So let's say, let's move the origin here. Let's say this is the annulus from 2 to the j minus 1 to 2 to the j plus 1. And now you split this annulus into 2 to the j over 2 wedges. Yeah. And now what you do is you find a partition of unity associated to this partitioning of the frequency plane. You find functions VJL, which are supported in these QJLs. and which satisfy sum over all j l v j l xi squared is equal to 1 for all xi. If j is equal to 0, then I should say q0 is just all f numbers with uh, absolute value less than or equal to, for example. It's not so important whether there is a p over 2 here or, or you know, 2 or 10 or so. It's important you split the frequency plane into annuli of scale 2 to the j and you split this annuli into wedges into j 2 to the j half wedges. You construct a partition of unity. Um, I will not say how to construct this partition of unity, but Axel will tell you tomorrow in, in great detail, actually. Yeah. What I do want to show you, at least heuristically, is how from such a partition of unity you can construct tight frames. Okay, you build your dictionary in frequency space by modulating these partition functions. Okay. Here, up here in this slide, we have a formula, a scary looking formula. But what's the basic idea? Why do we construct these, these frames like this? What's the basic idea? So, if we want to compute an inner product of f with uh, now, if we want to compute the L2 norm of f, then this is equal to the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. Yeah. Okay. This is equal to the integral over R2 of f hat of xi squared d xi. This is equal to, now we have this partition of unity, so we have to use it somewhere. Oh, again, I have to change talk, okay. Integral over r2 of f hat times v j l squared. Yeah. 
this is clear. I mean, I can do this because we have this summation to one. But now this fragment of f hat is supported in such a wedge because I multiply it by a function, by this function v, j, l, which is supported in here. So actually I can write this as an integral over q, j, l, over this wedge. So this is, I can write this as a sum over j and l of the L2 norm of f hat times v, j, l in L2 of q, j, l. This is now an L2 norm of a function defined on a compact set. On a compact set, what is the most natural orthonormal basis or representation for functions, nice functions on compact set? Fourier series. I can just do a Fourier series expansion of this guy which supported on this QJL. Okay. Now, okay, we know that QJL is a subset of so I mean you always if, if you have let me maybe draw a picture here I mean this wedge is always contained in like a rotated rectangle of length of order 2 to the j and width of order 2 to the j over 2. Yeah. And on this rectangle I can just use a tensor product Fourier basis. So this, this is what this uh, means um, and phi j l is equal to this pi over 2 L minus 1, 2 to the minus j over 2, L. Okay, and now we know this is a rectangle, a rotated rectangle, so therefore up to a constant, so 2 to the minus 3, 4, j, exp, r, theta, j, L minus 1, d2 to the minus j k psi for all k in z2 is orthonormal orthogonal basis for l2 of q of of this guy of this r phi j l d2 to the j minus 2, 2 squared. Yeah. So I just do a Fourier expansion on this rectangle up here. And now I insert this a Fourier expansion. So this is an orthonormal basis. Well, you would have to add a constant here if like some pi or I don't know. It's, it's not really very relevant. But uh, I can now expand and characterize this L2 norm by its Fourier coefficients. So this would be equal then to sum j l sum over all k in z2 of inner product f hat with v j l times x 2 to the minus 3 j divided by 4 r JL to the minus 1, D2 to the minus J, K, Xi. Yeah? You can do this. So, more or less, your L2 norm is 
equal to the squared sum of these coefficients. And what do you have here? You have the, just this scary expression up there. Okay, hat. Yeah. So you have a tight frame. This sum, the L2 num squared is equal to the sum of squares, maybe up to a fixed constant here, which I will not go into. Um, times the sum of squares of the transform coefficients. So I have a tight frame. I have a way to decompose a signal, uh, to reconstruct the signal. OK. Let's go back. Now, in space, I mean, I also want to know what these guys are in space. You know that modulation corresponds to translation. So this is just the Fourier transform of curvelets. Modulation corresponds to translation, space side picture. A curvelet is the inverse Fourier transform of these window functions translated. Translated along anisotropic grids, which are rotated according to this parameter L. Yeah. That's curvelets. And now you have a construction of a curvelet tight frame. And now I tell you what you should have in mind when you think of curvelets. Yeah. First, this is the result that I just proved. This system const constitutes a passable frame. Great. So I can compress, I can decompose my signal into the, with these coefficients, and I can just throw away all of those coefficients except for the largest ones. I can see how, how well I can then approximate my signal. But now let's, let's be still a little more intuitive what are curvelets. Basically, the picture you should have in mind is they are functions which are oscillatory in one direction, non-oscillatory in the other direction. Their essential support is anisotropic. So this width is smaller than their length. Width is about 2 to the j. Length is about 2 to, uh, two to the minus j. Length is about 2 to the minus j half. They are as I said, oscillatory, they get translate, they get scaled using an anisotropic scaling. Yeah. So this is not an isotropic scaling, they get more needle-like if the scale increases, they get rotated with the parameter L, translated. And if you, if you apply these operations basically and you, you collect all of these waveforms, you get a curvelet frame. That's just intuitive. Okay, and now, using this intuition, we know that these, I mean, wavelets are supported in an anisotropic quadrilateral. We, we know these curvelets have anisotropic support. I've shown you this picture. And now, you can make a back of the envelope calculation. This is a circle, these are curvelets, supports of curvelets at scale zero. And I just see how many elements I need to cover this singularity if I consider this scaling relation, that their length of their support is always of this size and their width is of that size. Now, it's easy to see that in order to cover the singularity curve, you need of order two to the j half elements. So you cover them in such a way that always their longer side will, will you know, be tangent to the, to the curve in a way, and, you, and the length is about two to the minus j half. So you need about two to the j half elements to cover this curve. Yeah. So you cut at the fixed scale. You need about two to the j half coefficients, throw everything else away. 
Now, okay, you can show that the rest, due to some limited smoothness of these cartoon functions, the rest will decay and it will induce an error which is not bigger than 2 to the minus j half. Yeah. And what we get from this very, very, very heuristic uh, considerations is the following. Curvelets are optimal for cartoon images. The end time approximation rate, if you just decompose a signal, a cartoon image in a curvelet frame, you just keep the n largest coefficients. The error that you make is of order n to the minus one. And this is optimal. Curvelets are optimal for cartoon images. Actual proof, much more complicated than what I just told you. Um, let's see. I think uh, I will not go into the proof more deeply. So again, if you want to know more about it, you can ask me. But just one more word. I mean, you know, here I just said you just need so and so many curvelets to, to uh, cover this singularity curve. But there are many more curvelets. There are those sitting here which are oriented in a different direction. Yeah. And basically you have to show that the inner products of this singularity with those curvelets which are oriented, for example, in this direction or in that direction, that those coefficients are negligible. And this is not so easy, but it can be done. Okay. So this is really a, a, a fundamental result. It shows that we can achieve this goal. I can approximate if I have a, a function with anisotropic singularities. I want to approximate it up to five digits. Then I only need 10, 100,000 bits instead of 10 to the 10 for wavelets. Yeah? So this really is a big deal. All right. Now, the next step that we would like to take is um, we now have this theoretical construction. Yeah? And we have shown that it actually does everything that we wished for. Yeah? But next step, of course, we want to develop fast algorithms. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to talk about algorithmic issues here today, but clearly there is a big problem. Our curvelet construction is basically, you know, you have your basis functions, which in Fourier space are supported in such a wedge. And to realize this directionality, you rotate the basis functions. Yeah? So there is a rotation involved. Now, I mean, when you want to implement, what do you get typically? I mean, an image most of the time is, uh, at some point, is represented as like a, a, a matrix. Yeah? So it's, it's a grid, you have a grid, a quadratic grid, digital grid, and you have the, the gray values associated to each grid element. Now, let's say, I have my grid and I mean in order to do this curvelet transform I have to, to rotate this data somehow. Now what is a rotation by let's say 0 0.01 angles on a grid? Uh, not really well defined uh, so because the rotated values will not be grid samples anymore. Uh. So you have to do something. Now, what are, uh, you want to have another kind of linear transform, simple transform in place of rotation matrices, which kind of realize directionality while preserving a digital grid. That's the main idea 
behind what is now called, or what has always been called since its introduction, shearlets. You replace rotation by shearing. Okay, now here another big slide. What are shearlets? Okay, well, let's start up here. Again, you have three parameters. Let's forget about this epsilon for a moment. J, the scale, L, the direction, K, the location. And now, I build my frame differently. I have, this is just a low scale uh, component, uh, so this is just, you know, translates of a, of a nice function, a scaling function. And here, a shearlet is constructed by, you apply your anisotropic dilation, again, so you have your, your basis function, psi, you apply your anisotropic dilation, you make it needle-like, and then somehow you have to make it directional. Yeah? You have to kind of rotate it, but we have seen that rotations are not allowed. So what one can do is instead of rotating, so I have my function psi, and the support is, let's say, here. Then I can do this anisotropic dilation, psi j0, 0, whatever, yeah. and then we just scale it, and this will be 2 to the minus j, this will be 2 to the minus j over 2. And then for curvelets we rotate, we rotate it, for shearlets we shear it. So you get something like this. Yeah? Support J L zero. Psi Psi J L zero. Yeah. Okay. That's what shields do. Now we get a problem. I can, of course, how do I get from here? I mean, what about larger angles? Yeah, I want to get from here to here because I want to cover all directions. I cannot really do this using shearing. Why? Because, I mean, if I keep on shearing and shearing and shearing, what I will eventually get is something very degenerate, uh, like this. This is an awful drawing. I apologize, but I hope you, you know what I mean. Yeah? I mean, if I shear it and shear it and shear it, I, I will just get something which is, which is just uh, completely elongated and which does not look like a rotation anymore. So what do we do? We cannot go from here to here using shearing, so we just, you know, apply to this element only shears up to about 45 degrees, and then we just take a second system, a second shearlet system, where we start, where we scale in, in the other direction, so we go from here to here by scaling, and we shear this guy in the other direction. And this is why we have this binary parameter epsilon here in this definition. And, okay. So we have a vertical shearlet and a horizontal shearlet. Psi zero is the vertical one, psi one is the horizontal one. And we apply to both of them this anisotropic dilation and the shearing operation, where we only shear up to about two to the j half, so to, to get to about 45 degrees. And, the, and then for directions which are less steep, we use the second system where we 
scale in the other direction and, and, and shear this one. I hope this is like intuitively clear to you to some extent. So it's just the point is we need to replace rotations and, and we can do this with shears. But for very large shears, uh, they do not look anymore like rotations. Uh, so we have to split into two cones and this construction is then called cone adapted shearlets. And you can also do a band limited construction of shearlets and you can construct tight frames, passival frames and so on. Much very similar to, the proof is very similar to the one I've, I've presented to you. But now you have something that you can actually implement because shears on a grid you can implement. Just a mapping which preserves the grid, no problem. And now, for instance, if you construct this band limited shield frame, what you can show is that they also satisfy this optimal approximation property for cartoon images. Yeah. Okay. I should say that shearlets have been introduced after curvelets, shortly after them, um, by Demetrio Labate, Guido Weiss, Wenkyu Lim, Gita Kutinjok, and others. And um, now they are more or less the state, the go to tool for these anisotropic problems because they provide a, a unified treatment of the continuous world and the discrete world because you can directly implement them. It's better adapted to data sampled on digital grid. This means uh, this, well, fast algorithms exist for shields. By now many different algorithms. So you can even construct compactly supported shield frames yeah, so, so not only band limited, but also with compact support. But I mean, the theory is by far not as nice yet as like for compactly supported wavelets. So for example, you can construct compactly supported shearlets, but you, you, do not, you cannot construct tight frames, for example, of compact support. So if you want to reconstruct, you always have to reconstruct numerically using, for example, uh, conjugate gradient, so you have to use iterative methods. So this is more for the experts in, in, in frame theory. Yes? Yes, that's the state of the art, yes. But of course it's a, it's a like, one of the big goals also to construct tight frames. But actually these compactly supported shielded frames, they are quite nice. I mean, you know, it's not tight, but, but the frame bounds are like four numerically. And so you just need a few CG iterations. So it's not that, that much of a drawback actually. Software has been developed also in, in Coutinho's group at, under this shielded org. Um, now you might wonder, um, in the beginning I told you about uh, function systems which are generated by rotations and anisotropic dilations. Um, there is a general concept which is known as parabolic molecules, which uh, describes systems of functions constructed according to this principle. It's a very general definition and it includes curvelets and shearlets and also some other lets like contourlets. Um, and what we could actually do is we could kind of flesh out what is behind this sparse approximation result. So we could show for this very general class of, 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 of functions that they all ye yield sparse approximation if some very simple to check um, assumptions are satisfied. So let me just, just to give you a glimpse of, of oh, sorry, 
of um, what this means. Yeah. So you have, assume you have such a system of functions, but now this psi can also change with these parameters. I relax this definition. I say that psi can depend on j, l, and k. So you have different functions generating different curvelets or shearlets. And using this uh, generalization, you can show that curvelets and also shearlets and, and all the other systems which are known satisfy this with a nice set of functions generating these systems. And now let's go back again. And now what you have to check in this um, in this more general framework is just the following. Like wavelets, you just have to check, well, you have your function system, phi j k l is equal to 2 to the 3 j over 4 times psi j k l of r phi j l d 2 to the j x minus k or something. All you have to check is that um, these guys are uniformly smooth, so they have to be smooth. That's simple to check. They have to be loca localized in space. Uh, so they have to decay to some extent, and this is precisely quantified how much. And they have to possess anisotropic moments, vanishing moments. They have to satisfy something like this. Integral of all polynomials in X times Psi J K L of X and Y dx is zero or close to zero to for all polynomials, univariate polynomials, so this polynomial is only in X, polynomial of degree less than or equal some, some number, let's say L. And you can really say how many vanishing moments do you need, how localized in space, how smooth these guys have to be. So these are really simple, now simple uh, criteria which kind of make the constructions less obscure, I would say, that you can verify if you have a frame which satisfies this and it is built in such a way, you already, you get this optimal approximation. Okay, some literature. This is the original work which introduced these curvelet frames and showed that it optimally represents objects with piecewise C2 singularities. The proof, as I said, is really complicated. I doubt that there are more than, but I mean this, I'm not sure, I doubt that there are more than 20 people in the world who have read this proof line by line. I don't know. But really read it line by line because it is quite complicated. Um, regarding shearlets, there is a book, Shearlets, Multiscale Analysis, uh, for multivariate data, edited by uh, Gita Coutinho and Demetrio Labate, and it contains an introduction to shearlets and, and also theoretical results. And here is the paper on parabolic molecules, which you can, for instance, find on my web page. Let's talk about some related systems. Of course you can, I mean, now that we are in the mood of doing anisotropic dilations, we can also do different anisotropic dilations. We don't have a square root here, but some arbitrary power. Yeah. And you can play the same game. If beta is one half, you have this parabolic dilation which generates curvelets and so on. If beta is one, you have an isotropic dilation, you get wavelets. If beta is zero, then you only scale in one, in one dimension. And then you get what is called richlets. 
And so oh, you can also, well, okay, yeah, you can, you can do this, and you can construct tight frames, again on Fourier partitionings, which are accustomed to this type of of, of uh, anisotropic dilation. So here you get how you partition the Fourier plane if you want to construct tensor product wavelets. Here you get our curvelet partitioning. And this is a richlet partitioning. It looks almost the same. Only you have this annulus at scale 2 to the j. And you split it into 2 to the j wedges. Here you only split it into 2 to the j half wedges. Yeah. If you split more, you get richlets. Now, OK, what you can do is you can do, I mean, this is like a bit of a just, you know, some technical extension, yeah. So you can you can introduce a more general signal class where your functions are only piecewise C alpha and your curve is actually uh, it's not C two, it's also C alpha. And then you can show that with with these different types of scaling that they are optimal for this more general signal class. Okay, I mean this is nice because you cannot might not always have exactly C two smooth singularities. So this is one extension. Another one is, uh, it seems that Filippo De Mari wants to <laughs> join the discussions. Um, you can also wonder what happens if I have a signal class of piecewise C alpha functions, and now your singularity is a very specific structure. Namely, it is discontinuous along a line. And you don't know where the line is. It can be anywhere. It can have any orientation. What you can show is that with richlets, richlets are optimal for line singularities. If you have data which is smooth apart from line singularities, you should use richlets. Because as one can show for such data, they approximate these piecewise smooth functions at a rate comparable to globally smooth functions. Yeah. So they optimally resolve line singularities for any for any angle, for any type of lines. And such uh, functions appear, for instance, in PDEs. Yeah. We will take a very brief look at that later on. So now Okay, here is some literature on richlets. So you have the printout. So this is richlets. These are these, these generalized molecules um, which we have introduced. You can download all the papers on my web page. And now let's let's look at some some applications. I will show you three applications. Two of them um, not by myself, one of them done in my research group. So the first one is uh, morphological component analysis. So you have a, an image of a neuron and you want to separate these curve-like structures from point-like structures here. And apparently this is of, of use in Alzheimer's disease uh, diagnosis. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert in, in, in medicine, so, but that's of interest certainly. You have a signal which is composed of two different structures, curve-like structures, point-like structures, and you want to separate those two parts. Now one could get an idea from the talk that I have from, from what you have heard so far. You have point-like structures and you have curve-like structures. Wavelets are optimal for point-like structures. Curvelets or shearlets are optimal for curve-like structures. Yeah? So what would be a good idea? If I want to separate my f, yeah? this is now this function. This is a function yeah, on this grid. And it is given by F1 plus F2. So you have, as it, 
it is given as a sum of a function which only contains curve-like singularities and only pointwise singularities. Now, my a priori knowledge that I have from the theoretical analysis that we have carried out since yesterday is this part will be sparse in a curvelet frame because it only has curved singularities and this part has, is sparse in a wavelet dictionary because it only has point singularities. So we have a way to regularize this problem by imposing, well, let's see here. Let's take a wavelet dictionary, let's take a curvelet dictionary. Consider the combined dictionary of wavelets and curvelets. Consider a signal which can be written as a curved part and a point part. We know that this guy is sparse in a curvelet dictionary, but not in a wavelet dictionary. We know that this guy is sparse in a wavelet dictionary, but not in a curvelet dictionary. Yeah. So what do we do? We try to look for the sparsest representation, which in this combined basis, in the wavelet basis and the curvelet basis. And we guess, we estimate, well, okay, this guy, this part here is sparse in the wavelet dictionary, so it is my estimate for the point component. This guy is sparse in the curvelet dictionary, so I guess it will be a good estimate for this curved part. And this is what can be done. So let's see here. Oops. Yeah. This is what can be done. Um, what do you do actually? You apply first the band pass filter on your signal. So this is just what you do. You, you decompose this F using maybe a Laplacian pyramid scheme, you, you, you decompose it into parts which, are, which have frequency content in an annulus around 2 to the j. And for each of those annually, you, you make this L1 minimization. So you take, you, you compute the arg min of all Fun of all linear combinations which make up this frequency projected part of f at frequency 2 to the i. And you compute, you try to compute the sparsest representation. Many of you probably have seen compressed sensing and so you cannot do this, you cannot really compute the sparsest representation. Uh, because it is a, a, a problem of combinatorial complexity. But what you can do is you do, can do convex relaxation. And you, you take the L1 norm as a measure of sparsity. It's, it's similar to TV minimization, for example, where you also you know, suppose that the gradient is sparse and you measure the fairness of, a, of, a, of an image by the L1 norm of, of, of the gradient. Uh, so L1 norm is a good measure of sparsity because it, it is con convex and you can actually solve this. Yeah. You solve for the combination which gives you this, this function and you want the combined L1 norms of these frame coefficients to be as small as possible. Now, there is a beautiful result by Donohue and Kutinyuk and it, it, it says that this actually works and you can, you can prove this. You can prove that asymptotically as the scale increases, I get, I really catch this curve-like and point-like part. Yeah. And this is due to the unique structure of curvelets and wavelets. Yeah. So this is one application. And what is also nice is that this gives a link between harmonic analysis and, and compressed sensing uh, because it's, it, it also involves notions from compressed sensing like incoherence and, and, and so on. 
and the, the, the proofs are on a high level very reminiscent of, of recovery guarantees in, in compressed tensing. Okay, now let's go to a completely different application. An application from PDE theory. Now, okay, I mean, if you're not, you know, into PDEs, this will look scary to you. I mean, this is a PDE, so-called kinetic transport equation. And basically what it does, it, it, it is used to, to, to simulate hot gases, for instance, or also some socioeconomic processes, radiative transport. Um, it is a, a PDE that is really, I can just say it is very relevant. So it is kind of like the Laplace equation. Um, and, it, and what it does is it is composed, so it, it measures a, a distribution of some density, gas density in a phase space. And this phase space, if you can interpret this as a radiative uh, phase space density and, and it is associated with a direction and a location. Yeah. So it, it measures the intensity in a direction at a point. And it evolves with time and the evolution is governed by free transport. So this is just modeled by this guy. Absorption, this is modeled by this guy. External sources which might add um, intensity or take it away and a scattering operator which makes this density interact with a surrounding medium. Yeah. And this is typically an integral operator. Now it turns out these equations are really difficult to solve. First of all, they are not so low dimensional because I mean this x is in omega, d dimensional domain, this s is a direction. So you get a couple of, of more dimensions than you would expect for usual Laplace equation. Now, for us, what is interesting is that this operator, this is the only differential operator in this PDE. It only assumes smoothness of u in the direction of s. So, solutions will have line singularities. Okay, and, and I, I mean, okay, you cannot use standard way, uh, FEM discretization for this. Yeah? If you do it, you will get ill-conditioned systems. You will get linear systems and the, their condition number will, will be very bad and you will run into trouble. And now our goal, this is joint work with Axel Obermeier, was to construct adaptive approximation schemes in opti which operate in optimal complexity. So now we do not want to approximate a given image we want to approximate a solution to a PDE. What is the right discretization? Well, we know that typically these solutions have line singularities. I mean, why not turn to ridgelets? Yeah, because we know ridgelets are optimal for approximating line singularities. And now here is a result that, that, that we could achieve. If you fix the direction S and you consider this linear transport equation and you have a solution which is smooth apart from a line discontinuity, then what can you do? You can construct a richlet-based algorithm which computes your best n-term approximation but the best n-term approximation of the unknown solution. Yeah? So it also solves the PDE. And all of this it does in n flops. So you can even count the number of arithmetic operations that you, you have to carry out, that your computer has to carry out. In n flops, we can compute an approximation which approximates our solution at the optimal rate. So this is quite remarkable because this algorithm, it doesn't know, it doesn't even know the function that it would like to approximate because it is a solution to a PDE. But it can still do it in optimal complexity. 
It can do it as fast as, is, as if I would just give you the solution of the PDE and then try to approximate it. Okay, and now, I mean, we can implement this and you have a, like a solution which has a discontinuity here. And this algorithm finds this discontinuity and it converges exponentially to the solution. So basically what this means is if I spend n degrees of freedom for solving this PDE, I get an error which decays exponentially in n. Now what is the best I can do with conventional methods, finite elements, wavelets, other methods? It's n to the minus one half. Now compare this if I want to get my solution up to five digits, I need 10 to the 10 bits, flops. Now, we have here exponential convergence. If I want to compute the best n-time approximation up to five digits with this Richlet scheme, I need basically a logarithmic amount of bits, so I, I just need like five or ten bits, five bits. Yeah. So that's how much an exponential rate improves uh, on such a low polynomial rate. So this is quite dramatic and one can uh, use this scheme which operates for fixed S to solve the full kinetic transport equation, also with the scattering operator. So, I mean, this is just an example of, so here you have uh, the external source term, which injects heat here, and you have an obstacle, you have a wall, and, and, and you, well, you, you measure the incident radiation, which is a quantity of interest for this type of problems, and you can, you can combine this Richlet scheme in space with, with what is called a sparse collocation method. We, this, this, this method kind of mitigates the high dimensionality. So it combines directions and spatial resolutions in a way that you don't really, you, you don't really feel this curse of dimensionality. And okay, that was the, another example. So this is the first convergent adaptive solver for such transport PDEs. There is. Here is some literature um, joined with Simon Etter and Axel Overmeyer describing a Richler transform which can be applied to these radiative transport equations. And, uh, you can uh, find the theoretical analysis in this preprint, which is available on my webpage. Um, we also have a software package uh, for this Richler transform and this. Uh, radiative transport equation. You can also download it on my web page. Okay, and we have found a link, another link between harmonic analysis and numerics. Yeah. And again, this is a problem. You have to use richlets to solve it like this. Yeah. So it's really a problem that, that just cannot be solved in such a way with, with, like, with other conventional methods. Again, Okay, here is another um, work which has been done by Dimitrio Labate and others, namely to, to classify singularities. You want to separate edges from corner junctions from points. Also, this can be done using shearlets. Why? Because the shearlet coefficients have a directional parameter, and if you have a shearlet which is sitting here, and which is oriented like in a, in a certain direction, you can precisely quantify the rate of decay of the shielded coefficient as the scale increases. This is the theorem, Gu and Labate from 2008. If I have a scale of 2 to the j, then, and I, I consider shielded coefficients sitting, for example, on a corner junction you will see that there are exactly two directions, two orientations of the shearlets on which the decay is slow, on all others it will be fast. So you know that you have a, a corner. Yeah. Here 
it will be fast. So if you're on a smooth part in your curve, you will, the decay will be fast. Whenever your shield is not aligned with the singularity, it will only be slow when your shield is exactly aligned with the singularity. And so on. In smooth parts, you have fast decay. And so you can kind of separate. You, you know it precisely the decay rate at a corner point, at a smooth part, at an edge. And you can use this to, to really very precisely separate such a signal into corners. And, and you know, in 3D, you still have more singularity types. And one can also extend this to 3D. So Labate has, has done this to, to some extent. Um, here is a, um, this is a chapter in this book that I mentioned to you. So, analysis and identification of multidimensional singularities using the continuous Schiller transform, because I, I lied to you a little bit. So, these results, they contain a continuous version of the Schiller transform, where the scale and the angles and the locations are continuous, not discrete. But, uh, I mean, Okay, this is, I think, not so central to, to this presentation today. Software is also available. So you can try out all these algorithms. And now you have a link between harmonic analysis and geometry. So using these frames which are constructed from harmonic analysis, you can do geometry. You can give a, a surface uh, in 3D and you can take it this geometric object, you can do shielded analysis on it and it will tell you precisely where are the smooth patches, where are the edges, where are the junctions and so on. Okay. Of course, there exists a zillion of other applications. Uh, I'm not going to, to... Just, you know, if you're interested, talk to me and, and ask me about uh, more applications. I have just now kind of selected three applications that I like because they they really treat problems that cannot be tackled with other methods. I mean, of course, you can also do like, you know, denoising, you can do in-painting, you can do de-blurring, but okay, I mean, you can do that also with other methods. But solving a transport equation or separating in this way with, with these guarantees, you cannot do with other methods. And this is why I chose these three applications. And now it's time to summarize. Well, okay, what did we do? We constructed frames by partitioning frequency plane. This gave us a very powerful way to construct dictionaries with built-in directionality. Shearlets, ridgelets, alpha molecules. And these systems can do things that conventional systems cannot do. Due to this Fourier-based construction, you can get, in many cases, fast algorithms using FFT, for example. Now, the bottom line, or what I would like to, to, to tell you as a take-home message, is that harmonic analysis, it is, it is really a treasure trove of, 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 of construction methods, of, of dictionaries, which you can use for, for, for a variety of different problems. So, and this is very much how, how, I, how I see harmonic analysis. Harmonic analysis is about finding decompositions of operators, finding decompositions of functions. That's, that's the origins of, of harmonic analysis. I mean, the Fourier series exists because it diagonalizes a wave equation. Yeah. So, so that's what it is about. And I think it is a very well, exciting research area because it's still, it is still opening up. It is opening up to numerical analysis, as I have shown you. It is opening up to geometry. It is opening up to compressed sensing. So that's why I like it a lot. This is the end of part two. And thank you very much for listening and staying awake after so many hours of, of lectures. So thank you very much. Thank you.